Hi everyone, on this episode we've got some great downtown Brooklyn spots to show you. And I hear with some very interesting history. So join us for Breaking Bread. Welcome to Breaking Bread. I'm Monsignor Jamie. And I'm Johanna Bota. Today, we're visiting some of the downtown areas of Cobble Hill, Carroll Gardens, and Park Slope. Downtown Brooklyn has some of the most beautiful churches in all of Brooklyn. Today, we will be visiting St. Agnes on Sackin Street in Carroll Gardens. Now, St. Agnes was built in 1905 by the famous architect Thomas Horton, who also built St. Francis Xavier over on 6th Avenue in Park Slope. Well, and speaking of Park Slope, there's a great restaurant. It's New American, and I'm dying to try it. I'm in. Let's go. Here to tell us a little bit more is executive chef owner Ryan Geronic. Ryan, thank you for having us. Thank you for coming. So, tell us a little bit more about the building. Betchmark's building has a very interesting past. What did it used to be? This building's been around for about 120 years, so it was, turn of the century, it was an ice house, coal house, so all the coal and ice for the neighborhood would come here, be distributed throughout the neighborhood. There was a series of underground tunnels that led up to the point of the entrance to this building, as well as train tracks that go behind the building that shoot out to the Gowanus Canal. Tell us a little bit more about what kind of food Benchmark is. We concentrate on new American cuisine, a uh, heavy emphasis on steaks and shops, try to source as much locally as we can. Um, I have a great network of, network of farmers and purveyors I use. We have a great Green City Market two blocks away from us that's open twice a week. So we do a lot of shopping there as well as just a lot of upstate meat. Um, a lot of, I have a few upstate farmers that I contact regularly. Like all of, all of our ground beef comes from Salem, New York. All of our, all of our strips come from upstate in the Finger Lakes. So it's, it's a nice network of farmers in New York. What is New American? New American's kind of an influence from everything I've worked in. Okay. Um, I've done Latin food for five years, fine dining French, um, a little bit of Italian food. So in 20 years working in restaurants, I've just kind of melded everything together that I've learned over the years and kind of came up with my own style. So You have yeah. a, a great reputation. Every time I speak to someone about going to a place to eat in Brooklyn, they would say, have you gone to Benchmark? Now, how long have you been here? Uh, almost four and a half years right now. It's great. Yeah. Great. And I'm here almost every day still, so I live upstairs. So. I think it's a great commute. job. That's an easy commute. <laughs> so it's easy to watch over. What is the difference between pasture raised and grass fed? Pa everything is pretty much grass fed at the beginning of its life. There's a couple different ways to raise cattle. It's grass or corn finished. Okay. I serve both. Um, all of our cows are pasture raised, so that means they're out and about. They're happy cows. They have beautiful fields to walk around in. Um, a few of our chops I do with a corn finish just because it kind of beefs them up and makes them a little bulkier and gives a better intramus intramuscular fat to them. Okay. So, tastier product. Grass-fed beef doesn't get as much intramuscular fat. It also takes a little longer for the cow to grow because none of our cows have hormones or antibiotics. Mm -hmm. We're pretty much all sustainable animals. But with grass-fed beef, it's a little older animal, so it has a little more iron flavor okay. as far as Corn, fi corn finished beef is a little beefier, it's a little more robust, it has a little more fat to it. It's all dependent on what you like. My business partner is Argentinian, so oh, well, they do about beef. <laughs> Argentinian <laughs> grass-fed <laughs> beef is like his thing, so we have a few grass-fed cuts. Um, I'm a Midwestern boy, so I like corn finished beef. Yeah. And it just means the last six to eight weeks of the life, they start to add a little bit of grain to the diet, just to bulk up the cow a little bit and give it a better beefier flavor. So what are you gonna prepare for us today? Today I'm doing a trio of beef short ribs. Uh, oh. It's been <laughs> on our menu since day one. It's one of the few things I can't change or take off. There would be riots. Thank you. Well, I can't wait. Yeah, please, Let's please go try. try it. Let's go. Well, I'm really excited, so let's try it. This is the real test. I know. Let's see, which one are you going to try first? I'm going to try his favorite first, okay. the chef's favorite. Yeah, that's definitely good. Now, do you have, you have to eat it together, right? I would definitely eat it together. Okay. Gives you that New York experience of... Uh, Mm. So what do you think? Mm. I 
It is so nice and soft. Smoke six hours, so. The, really and you can get the smoky flavor, but it's not overbearing. It's not too much. And that kind of like freshens it up. Yeah. It's really nice. I love the sauerkraut. Is there something citrusy in it? Uh, it's pretty much truffle and salt and cabbage. Hmm. And that's it. And yeah, it just ferments, nice. so it gets that little. <laughs> All right, let Taste the it. let the Latin girl do it. Let the Latin girl do it. Taste it. But you know what? It's not this one. It's not that spicy that you can't enjoy it. Oh no, you can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, really, no, no. I'm just saying, like. It's so good. It's the umami going through with the fish sauce it really helps it out. Now, the spiciness is it coming from the beef or is it coming from the carrot? A little bit of both. Okay. Um, there's Korean chili paste in both parts of it, so mm -hmm. it really comes through in both. A lot less in the kimchi on the bottom than in the marinade on the rib, but. Now this is with the celery root? Yes. And that's marinated also in the? Uh, the celery root's just pretty much pureed with a lot of butter. And the short rib is? Braised for about four to five hours. And red wine and veal stock. I mean, this is just very time consuming in terms of preparation. Yes. Putting it together is a matter of minutes. All right. So the, uh, marinade. All right, I'm gonna try the middle. Now that melts in your mouth. Yeah. It is so tender. All right. Hmm. The fat's good for you. No, the fat is good, but you know, sometimes it's like a weird texture. Yeah. But it I just melts down so nice. Yeah. And you know, the portion sizes are just right. It's not a you know a lot you know like 24 ounces of beef or when you eat a steak or something like yeah. that. Yeah, we have that option ounces. too. Especially um, they have desserts and they yeah. have appetizers. <laughs> well, there's also all sorts of different flavors, which make you feel like you didn't miss out on anything. Right. Well, Ryan, thank you so much for thank having you. us here. Now, if you guys want to visit Benchmark, I'm going to give you guys the address. So here it is. If you guys want to try something very similar at home, here's a recipe. Don't go away. Up next, Johanna visits Carol Gardens. Breaking Bread. I am here with Peter, co-founder of Brooklyn Pharmacy in Cobble Hill. Peter, thank you so much for having us. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Um, I actually moved to this neighborhood because I had a little ice cream outside your bench right here and thought, wow, this is the perfect place to be. So. That's, that, you know, it's, it's actually <laughs> interesting for us because I feel like one of the ways we, and, and I speak about my sister and I, we kind of knew we made it was when we saw the first real estate listing. And it said, beautiful two bedroom house, close to the Brooklyn Pharmacy. Hey! <laughs> so tell us more about Brooklyn Pharmacy. How long have you guys been here? Um, we have been here for about five years. Okay. Open for four years. Um, and it's funny when, it's funny you say that it was something that kind of welcomes the community in because that was really our intention from the start. Tell me, there is a huge debate about egg cream. What is an egg cream? I mean, I'm 31 years old. I should know this, but let's just pretend that I don't. What's right. an egg cream? Well, I mean, I, I, I assume it all depends on what borough you're coming from, but essentially an egg cream is milk, seltzer, and syrup. So there is no cream or eggs in an egg cream? I mean, unless you really want it. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you want an egg in your egg cream, I'll put it well, what type, what type of egg cream do you guys make here at Brooklyn Pharmacy? We, I mean, we, got, we will do any style you like. Oh, but, nice. But basically, you know, we're in Brooklyn now, yeah. so we make the Brooklyn egg cream. So it's, what's in the Brooklyn egg cream? Um, it's the same thing, milk, seltzer, and syrup, but it's just made a little bit differently. Okay. Um, if, You're gonna show us how yeah, to, right? Yeah, I was gonna say, if you'd like. Awesome, I, I can, please. Okay, first thing we start off with, ice cold milk. You can see we're icing it. Everything has to be as cold as possible. I mean, that's... Secret. That's a secret. Take note, <laughs> ice cold milk. 
All right, so about two fingers of milk. Now, do measurements count? Are they no. very important? <laughs> I mean, because I would be like, chocolate syrup. It's, I mean, the proof is in the final product. Okay. So if you want to pay attention to what we're measuring, it's good, because this is going to be a good egg cream. All right, all right. But if you want to do whatever you want, do whatever you want. I still <laughs> make two fingers. You always run the seltzer a little bit. Okay. Now, is the seltzer also pretty cold? Seltzer is very cold. Cool. Okay. And then we're going to add Fox's Uvet syrup. You can use any other kind of syrup you want, but it won't be a Brooklyn egg cream. Okay. <laughs> so it's got to be Fox's Uvet. That's pretty much the way it goes these days. All right. So this. One finger. One finger. Two fingers milk, one finger chocolate syrup. Uvet. Take your spoon and go right back down to the middle. So you just get it. Just so the chocolate's incorporated. Okay. Now what I do at this point, I turn the spoon over and I bring seltzer back down. Oh, just to make it a little more. All right. All right, so see the Brooklyn head cream, it's got a nice white head. It sits proud and tall on top of the chocolate. And the key to a Brooklyn head cream is you don't ever use a straw. Oh. Right? So if anybody says, oh, give me a straw with my chocolate head cream. They're How like, come? Get out of here. Well, because you can see on the bottom, there's a little bit of chocolate. Yeah. Right? And if you use a straw, you get that first, and then you don't taste this. So I've tried the Brooklyn egg cream. Now I'm going to try the Bronx egg cream. All right, all right. Right. So when this settles down a little bit, what you're going to see is you have a nice, same kind of tall head here. But it's all chocolate. It's all chocolate, right? I do love chocolate. I might like the Bronx. Dirty. Should I wait for it to settle or should nope. I just go for it? Go for it. So far, kind of like, kind of like the Bronx one. It's good. All right, all right. So what's, it's okay, we're all one city. All right, we're all, it's all one <laughs> all egg cream, right? All one, 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 egg one cream. city, one egg cream. All right, so this is the Bronx. Now, what's the Manhattan? Okay, Manhattan egg cream. But I prefer, actually, I will say this. I do prefer the Bronx, but since I live in Brooklyn, I'm going to make the Brooklyn one win. Right. <laughs> Which was your favorite? Oh, I don't play favorites. Oh, come on. I, I, you I have like, to have I like a favorite. Everybody all the same. Fine. I'll let you have the Brooklyn one. I'll, I'll have the I'll have the Bronx one. Cheers. Here, well, I'm, I'm oh. going to make a fresh one, because I'll show you how we drink it around here. Oh. Drink fast. You... Okay. There's only two essential truths about egg creams. They don't get any more bubbly, and they don't get any colder. Okay. Right? So as soon as they're made, both of those things start disappearing. They start getting warmer and they start losing their face. Okay. So the right. faster you drink it, the more of that kind of bubbly refreshment you're gonna get. All right. So should I? Okay, I'll drink mine with you then. You made a Brooklyn style, right? I made a Brooklyn style. I'm in Brooklyn. When, when in Rome. Cheers. <laughs> All right. Who can use faster? Ooh, and I got a little nice carbonation there at the end from the bubbles at the top. Yeah. Now, if you want to make the Manhattan, the Brooklyn, or the Bronx egg cream, here's the recipe. Speaking of recipes, Ooh. I got something really cool for you. All right. I love surprises. Okay. So we wrote a book, ah. right? And it's all about the soda fountain. It's got both the history and recipes. So if you want to make any of the different kinds of egg creams, if you want to take a chocolate egg cream and turn it into a flatbush float, if you want to make a cookie monster sundae. Ooh, I like the name cookie monster. They used to call me that in college. <laughs> <laughs> and there's also a lot of history you said, right? There, there, there is a lot of history. And that's one of the beautiful things about the soda fountain is that the history of the soda fountain is very uniquely American. Yeah. Um, and, and it's in New York, it's in Chicago, it's in Philadelphia, but it's also in California. 
It's in Florida. It's, it's really, um, it's a very interesting story. And so the last thing I have for you is I have a nice I pharmacy soda oh, fountain hat. Thank so you. You can take this book, go home, put on your pharmacy hat. I'm going to wear my pharmacy hat every time I come here. Yeah. <laughs> Did I put it on the right way? You put it on? Well, you know, it's New York, so you put it on and then you tip it to the side. <laughs> wait, wait, with my book. Well, thank you so much for having us here, Peter. Absolutely. Now, if you guys want to come to Brooklyn Pharmacy, here's the address. Welcome back to Breaking Bread. And on this cooking segment, it's all about desserts. And today I have with us Anthony Alimo. Alimo, yes. From Villabati Alba. Yes. Why does it have two names, Anthony? Well, it originally started as Villabate, and it's the town in which my family's from in Sicily. Uh, about eight years ago, we moved to a new location where there was previously a bakery, a very famous pastry shop called Alba Bakery. Right. Uh, very famous. and. Uh, the original owners retired, and it was one of their wishes that we kept the name on the on the sign outside, so Great. the album would always stay on 18th Avenue. So this is a family business. Yes. Oh, it's very family okay. business. Okay. So before you go into your desserts and uh, very famous desserts and yes. known throughout Brooklyn, I have a little favorite of mine uh, called. It's really made it's strawberry scones. It's a very simple recipe, and um, you can prepare it for breakfast, or you can have it as a dessert. And basically, what I have here is all-purpose flour, whole wheat flour, strawberries, buttermilk, some butter, cornstarch, um, and some baking powder, and a little bit of sugar. And we just mix it all together, pop it in the oven for about 35 minutes. When they come out, we'll just coat it with some uh, icing, confectionery sugar, buttermilk, and some toasted almonds. So first thing we do is we get our dry ingredients together, a little bit of flour whole wheat flour and white flour. We then throw in our cornstarch, baking powder, and a touch of salt. We then just mix that together for a second. Throw in our granulated sugar. And then some butter that we just cubed at room temperature. Now at this point, you don't want to mix it all together. We'll just kind of mix it like this and just kind of fold it together so that you have all the pieces of butter scattered throughout the mixture. And it should be like a coarse mixture. There we go. We throw in our buttermilk. Okay. Now this is where it gets a little tricky because now after you mix it a little bit, incorporate all that extra flour on the bottom of the bowl. Now after you mix this well, what you do here is then just incorporate your sliced strawberries. Now, of course, you can use blueberries, you can use peaches, you can use bananas, whatever you like to use. But if it's in any type of syrup, you have to drain that syrup. Now, when you put these strawberries in, you don't want to crush the strawberries. So you have to try to like just incorporate them. And then basically, you use your hands and we're gonna make like eight or nine. Kind of. And they don't have to be exactly round because as you can, you know, scones are all different shapes and kind of once they cook. And then you're gonna bake this for about 35 minutes. But before we bake it, we're gonna coat the tops to top with a little bit of buttermilk and some sugar in the raw. It's very coarse. Just wet my 
hands here. And now what we do is we take a little bit of the buttermilk and we just coat the top. Okay, take a spoon and just sprinkle some sugar on top. I preheat the oven at 400 degrees and we'll cook this for about 35 minutes. Okay. Those look great. Hope they taste good. As good as yours. <laughs> So that's my recipe, Anthony. Right. What do you have with us today? <laughs> today, I brought, today I brought something special. I brought family recipes. Very, very traditional. This is a ricotta. Uh, ricotta that we still actually use from our hometown in Sicily. Now is it true, I know there's a sign on your store that says, we ricotta flown in weekly from Sicily. Well, it's not really flown in weekly, but we do import it ourselves. You do import it, yes, okay. Yes, and it's, it's traditional sheep's milk ricotta. That's, that, that okay, makes all that's the difference. Okay, that's the difference. Oh, yeah. And we have uh, sfinge, the San Giuseppe, which are the St. Joseph pastries, and uh, cannoli shells. Those I can't, unfortunately, give you the recipes for. <laughs> uh, so what we have here is we have a sfinge, the shell. These are actually made from bignet, which is a pate choux that we actually fry. Uh, pot de choux baked is what you know as a cream puff. Right. When you fry it, you get a nice, nice uh, doughy shell. Now the pot de choux, and when you make the dough, I know you have to boil the water of and course. then throw the flour in. All so it's, that's why they come so fluffy and, yes. and airy. Yes. Okay. All right. So then I have the the ricotta that we added our chocolate chips, and we put it in. And these aren't like the zeppelins you find at the festivals. I noticed because usually they're. They're cut down the center and they're filled, but yes. you, you, you made like a little pocket. Yes, exactly. We make this pocket and we get this nice sphinger okay. right there. Now this is just your, see, your uh, imported regatta. This is imported regatta. And chocolate chips, nothing else. Chocolate chips, uh, candied fruit. Okay. And then uh, we had some cinnamon, some cinnamon, I can't get okay, no, it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Secret ingredients. Secret ingredients. And then, you know, the Sfinge San Giuseppe always gets a nice garnish. Because right. we Italians love to garnish everything. And a little uh, candied orange piece. Right. And a, a cherry. And some now you, you fill the cannoli cream with this, uh, the cannoli with the same cream. Yes, exactly. So here's our cannoli shell. It's a deep fried uh, cookie shell. And we fill it with the cannoli cream. There we got to. You got you to make sure, my dad says, you got to always make sure that there's cannoli cream. cream in the middle. All in the center. Yes. <laughs> yes. Alrighty. So now I see you use a, a, a spatula to yes. fill it. Well, you know, Some people use the, the, the uh, piping bag is, you know, pastry more, bag. Exactly. And it's faster. And in the pastry shop, we actually do use it. But if the, you're at home, you right. can even use a spoon. And nice. Clean it up. And then, of course, these get garnished with the cherry. One side, and the orange peel, that's my favorite. <laughs> and the powder cherry. Powder cherry, always powder cherry. Yeah. How many cannolis do you uh, oh, sell well, a we year? Actually go into, Can you guesstimate? <laughs> well, guesstimate, we actually go into the hundreds of thousands. Hundreds of thousands. Yes. That's a lot of cannolis. It's 365 <laughs> days in a year. <laughs> Anthony, thank you. I really no, appreciate it. Let me finish up my uh, strawberry scones. Let okay. me go to the oven to see how they're doing. These look like they're just about done. So here we have our cooked scones. Mm, smell, smell good. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> now we're going to make a little bit of the icing. And I use here some confectionery sugar a little bit of buttermilk, a little drop of vanilla. Mix this around a little bit. Okay. I'm gonna take a little bit of your powdered sugar, make it a little bit thicker. And then we just scoop that on and then, okay. Put that down. Scoop a little bit. Icing on top. A little bit, a 
our sugar and our toasted almond. Now with the almonds, you have to sort of pat it down so that they kind of stick to the icing. Okay. Okay. So here we have strawberry scones. If you like the recipe, it's right there. So thank you, Anthony, for being with us. It's and my pleasure, uh, Father. I'm sure you'll see me very shortly. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you would like to try a, a cannoli at Villa Bate, you can go to 7001 18th Avenue in Bensonhurst and just ask for Anthony. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs>